Hello and welcome everybody to today's webinar, Why Projects Fail. And thank you for taking time out of your day to be with us. I'll start by saying the interest in this webinar has been immense, with nearly 7,000 people wanting information on how to attend. My name is David Emanuel. I am the Vice President of Operations for SWORD GRC here in North America and your proud sponsor of today's webinar, Why Projects Fail. Just a little housekeeping before we get started. We will be running a live Q&A at the end of the webinar, so we have enabled our Ask a Question feature. So if you have any questions, just pop them in there and we'll try and select a few at the end. And if you miss anything, don't worry, we will be sending around the on-demand webinar recording as soon as it's available. I'm joined here today by two of our solution consultants, Carl Magnuson and Mike Balut, who are going to share some findings about why projects fail and what can be done to have more successful project outcomes. As I said earlier, we have a very large audience, including companies from all over the world. Collectively, you're working on capital improvement projects, infrastructure and modernization, R&D, and even deconstruction in the form of mining and nuclear weapon decommissioning. Clearly, projects are everywhere. They have a massive impact on our economies and success of our businesses. So please pay close attention to learn about project failures, and more importantly, what you can do to change your business to generate better results. Of course, one caveat, project failures can be disturbing. The information we're sharing about specific projects is based on content that's publicly available. So please feel free to look further into anything that piques your interest. With that, I am very pleased to turn this over to Mr. Carl Magnuson. Carl, it's all yours. Thank you, David, and welcome everybody. My colleague Mike Balut and I are glad to have this chance to explore why projects fail. Indeed, thanks Carl. I'm looking forward to this discussion too. And since we do have such a diverse group today, can you start by defining our basic terms to get us all on the same page? Absolutely. The first thing to notice is this webinar is called Why Projects Fail. So we're going to start out with the big question, why? Right? We're not assuming, we're assuming that projects do fail. We're not asking if they do or not. We're asking why. Now let us define what we mean when we talk about projects. The Project Management Institute offers a helpful definition. A project is a temporary endeavor undertaken to create a unique product, service, or result. A project is temporary in that it has a defined beginning and end in time, and therefore it also has a defined scope and resources. And a project is unique in that it is not a routine operation, but a specific set of operations designed to accomplish a singular goal. Projects can range in scope, size, duration, cost, etc. But for our purposes today, we're going to consider anything that creates a unique product, service, or result. That leads us to the critical definition that we're focused on today, project failure. How do we determine that a project has failed and who makes that determination? Well, the declaration of a project as a failure can come from many sources, with the most common being the people who are expected to benefit, the people who worked on the project, and or the people who are funding the project. Typically, failure is based on one or more of the following criteria. The project, product, or outcome either didn't work as expected, cost more than expected, took longer to complete than expected, or resulted in personal or environmental harm. I'd like you to notice that the first three criteria for project failure includes the phrase as expected. All projects have multiple stakeholders, including investors, project planning and execution teams, and the people who will benefit from the project once it's finished. The measure of success or failure is based on the perceptions of each of those stakeholder groups, which we will discuss later in today's session. While these elements are used as criteria for failure, they're the results of other problems that occurred during the project, such as quality issues or failure to meet requirements, or poor, poor, plan, poor project planning or oversight, and many other risk factors. So with that as our foundation, let's turn our attention to some examples of projects that meet that failure criteria 
starting with the it doesn't work as expected one, and how that intends to snowball into costs and overruns and schedule delays. Three projects come to my mind uh, that have to do with something we don't get to do much these days, which is travel. First of all, many of you may remember the story of London Heathrow's Terminal 5. The situation at Heathrow Terminal 5 was described by the Evening Standard as a national humiliation. During the first five days, British Airways misplaced more than 23,000 passenger bags and canceled 500 flights, resulting in losses of 16 million pounds. Now, looking at this picture, if you're like me, the thought that one of your bags is in this mess is stomach turning. There are several contributing factors to the baggage problems, mostly related to IT issues such as poor network access and a bad configuration for the baggage reconciliation system. Interestingly, significant blame was actually placed on not having sufficient time and resources at the end of the project to test systems before the opening of the airport. We would argue that waiting to inspect quality at handover time doesn't allow any time or flexibility to address problems. Instead, quality tests need to be conducted throughout the project. It's a similar situation at Denver International Airport in the United States, where a grandiose vision of automated baggage handling systems and complex software failed to work as designed. A New York Times article put it this way, Denver Airport saw the future and it didn't work. The airport was left vacant for 16 months while completely replacing the baggage handling system with simpler, more reliable equipment cost an additional $560 million. We see contributing factors across both of these airport projects. Uh, those factors include underestimation of complexity, underestimation of project duration and budget, changes in requirements, dismissal of advice from experts, and as one journalist Riley put it, the tendency of these baggage systems to enjoy eating people's luggage. While we would hope that the industry would have learned from these prior airport projects, the opening of Germany's Berlin Brandenburg Airport in October 2020 suggests that we're still making many of the same types of mistakes and experiencing similar poor results. After 15 years of feasibility and pre-planning, construction finally started in 2006 with expected completion in 2011 and a cost of 5.4 billion euros. The Berlin Brandenburg Airport had many of the same types of problems as Heathrow and Denver. Additionally, something we may all be familiar with, scope creep, has evolved here to such a significant level that it's almost scope leap. Changes included adding a complete second level with shops and restaurants, and changing the very configuration and design of the airport from a rectangle to a U-shape with vastly greater square footage. Despite these major changes, the project has taken so long that features like USB charging ports or outlets for personal devices for passengers and the increased volume of passenger traffic weren't even considered. These can only add more costs in the future. The final inspection of the airport just before it opened in the fall of 2020 revealed 120,000 defects. Those defects included fire safety issues, automatic doors that didn't open, sagging roofs, and over 100,000 miles of cable that was dangerously wired. Some lights couldn't turn on and others couldn't turn off. Besides these primary risk drivers, the Berlin Brandenburg Airport's challenges were compounded by political pressures and project oversight that had been accused of pretending that there were no problems during construction, even as the situation grew worse. That led to contractor bankruptcies and shifts in responsibilities to unqualified parties. Finally, after missing seven target opening dates, the airport did finally open in October 8, 2020, nine years late and 1.6 billion euros over budget. As one news article you can see on the screen here says, the new airport was a story of failure and embarrassment. Wow, Carl, it sounds like trying to build a new airport is truly a challenging project, which certainly makes sense given the timeline and all of the moving parts However, I can think of some other failed projects that didn't have nearly as much complexity and had some other contributing factors than those that we've talked about so far. Yeah, Mike, I, I appreciate that. You know, 
Part of what we want to make clear in this webinar is that project failure exists across the spectrum of projects, not just travel or, or airline industries. And obviously they occur for a wide variety of reasons. So with that in mind, uh, what are the examples that you have that come to mind for you? Well, all of the airport projects were intended to create something new to better serve their communities, right? What happens when the primary reason for the project isn't to do something quite so grand, but instead the project goal is simply to reduce costs, such as using automation to increase productivity. For example, as part of the 2010 census preparations, the US Census Bureau launched a project to use specialized handheld devices in the field, primarily to automate address canvassing and to update maps with GPS. Well, the timing of some key activities quickly put the project on the path towards failure. The first draft of a complete user-validated set of requirements for the handhelds and their supporting infrastructure wasn't delivered until two years after the contract for the handheld devices had been awarded. A dress rehearsal was originally planned to provide a complete end-to-end -end test of all key census operations. However, because of some of those earlier problems with the handheld devices, among some other things, that testing was cut short. The Bureau tested only 23 of the 44 key operations, excluding the single largest process, follow-up on non-responses. Eventual testing revealed significant flaws in the handhelds, such as slow operation, memory problems, and a tendency to lock up when users entered large amounts of data. Ultimately, the U.S. Census Bureau resorted to the traditional paper-based approach requiring the Bureau to hire and train more staff at more expense. So by the end of the 2010 census, the cost exceeded the $11.3 billion estimate by an additional $1.7 billion. Well, that's just one example, and it happened to be included in a study by the U.S. Government Accountability Office. And that showed that 413 of 840 federally funded IT projects were either poorly planned, poorly performing, or both. What we've found is that many IT projects across the globe have similar problems. A joint study was done by McKinsey and Company and the University of Oxford, where they looked at 5,400 IT projects, all of which were over $15 million. On average, those projects ran 45% over budget. That's $6.7 million over budget per project. Worse yet, for all of that money, those projects only delivered 56% of the expected benefits. 918 of the 5,400 IT projects, which is nearly one out of every five projects, failed so badly that they threaten the very existence of the company. And in Western Europe, a study by Logica Management Consulting and the Economist Intelligence Unit looked at 380 senior executives, which showed 133 of them, roughly 35% had abandoned a major project in the last three years. And just over that, 37% of those had business process change projects that failed to deliver any benefits. Well, Mike, from, from those examples, it, it certainly does sound like projects designed to reduce costs and improve business processes need more attention to requirements um, and, and maybe to technological capabilities or system testing processes as well. Yeah, it, it, it sure does, Carl. And um, unfortunately, it doesn't end there. So there are some other factors in play here too. In some cases, it's not simply a matter of not wanting to invest money when the, or it is simply a matter of not wanting to invest money when the end goal is reduced cost. So in other cases, it comes down to the project's charter and the motivations of the people involved. Let me share highlights of two more examples that both had devastating personal impacts. I suspect that some of our audience here today has been involved in water infrastructure projects. Well, here's one that might leave a bad taste in your mouth, literally and figuratively. The Flint water project was initiated by the emergency manager 
who is charged with handling key business decisions for the city of Flint, Michigan. The sole motivation for this project was to reduce costs to the city, which due to declining economic conditions was considered insolvent. The project was to change the drinking water source for the city to save $5 million per year. And unfortunately, the, de the desire to cut costs was so strong that officials within the Michigan state government and the Department of Environmental Quality ignored early claims and clear evidence from the community, or maybe not so clear, that the water contained high levels of lead. Doesn't take a scientist to see from this slide that this water is not something you'd want to drink or use in any way. Well, six years later, here we are in 2021, and after having to drink and bathe with bottled water for a year and a half, the residents of Flint are still dealing with the impacts of blood lead levels that are over three times the federal action limit. And that's not all. They've also experienced the third largest outbreak of Legionnaire's disease recorded in US history. And that killed 12 people, sickened at least 87 more. And to top it off, they've now found elevated levels of cancer causing chemicals that were introduced as part of the city's solution to address fecal coliform bacteria in the water. My last project failure example for today, I think was doomed by its motivations and assumptions from early on. In 2011, the release of a more fuel efficient version of the Airbus A320 single aisle aircraft triggered a commercial response by Boeing to produce the 737 MAX aircraft. Boeing fast-tracked the design and the production of the new aircraft, taking orders even before the first prototype had been built. Along the way, to make the plane more attractive to customers, the 737 MAX was promoted as being the same plane to fly as prior versions, which meant it only required about two and a half hours of iPad training for the pilots. However, the new automated maneuvering software system was assumed to also have minimal effects and consequently it was excluded from all documentation, including certification and testing processes. In order to reduce the time to market, Boeing and the Federal Aviation Administration reached an agreement to delegate as much as possible of the aircraft certification process back to Boeing, sort of a fox in the hen house kind of situation. And I think we all know what the results of this project have been. Between the introduction of the 737 MAX in 2011 and 2018, well, Boeing's annual revenue and profits nearly doubled and their stock price quadrupled. However, while the stock initially went sky high, tragically, two of the planes crashed. All 346 people aboard Lion Air Flight 610 in October 2018 and all passengers on Ethiopian Airlines Flight 302 in March 2019 were killed. In response, the entire fleet of Boeing 737 MAX aircraft was grounded worldwide. Boeing's market cap has dropped over $25 billion. $30 billion of pending orders are at risk right now and payouts to Boeing suppliers and customers due to the grounding are expected to be billions more. In fact, as we look at this picture of grounded planes, you can see that many airlines around the world have been affected by this project. For example, companies like Southwest Airlines, whose business model is 100% dependent on Boeing 737. This type of event could be enough to threaten the sustainability of their business altogether. Yeah, Mike, you know, those last two projects, especially, are eye-opening about what a big part of project success is tied to the motivations behind the project and the importance of unbiased oversight and monitoring when lives are at stake, especially. In fact, you know, while we're talking about these examples in somewhat of a clinical or, or case study manner, I do want to point out it's an, one important reason that we care about this in the first place is that poor risk management literally can be a matter of life and death, not just cost and schedule. So kind of from there, just taking a look back at what we've, we've discussed today, I want to 
look at a number of key drivers that led to project outcomes not working as expected. Um, also, things like cost overruns, late completions, and of course, as we saw with Flint and the Boeing 30, 737, um, personal harm uh, and even death. Among these things I want to look at are underestimation of complexity, underestimation of project duration and budget, and changes to requirements. Um, we also talked about the failures to identify concerns in a timely manner, a lack of willingness to acknowledge those concerns, now leaving quality inspections until the end of the project and not learning from past project experiences. And third, we want to look at those causes, how they were compounded by project motivations of select stakeholders and decisions made in the alignment with those stakeholder interests, not necessarily in the best interest of the end users um, of those product deliverables. Mike, maybe it's my risk management bias or, um, you know, the principles of good project management or, or both, but it does seem like all of these project failures that we've talked about today were avoidable. Yeah, absolutely, Carl. I'd agree with that. In fact, over the years, I've had multiple executives tell me that their project failures weren't surprises, that most of them could have been avoided with more proactive risk management and knowledge about the lessons learned from their past projects both their failures and their successes. That's why traditionally experienced project managers are so valuable to these organizations. So Carl, perhaps you can suggest some ways that our audience can supplement their own experience with ways to expand the risk culture and the risk management practices within their organizations and uh, look at that as they relate to those underlying failure drivers that we've been discussing so far. Yeah, that's, that's a great next step. Um, so we'll kind of look at some of these principles. Uh, first of all, like I said, we're looking at underestimation of complexity, underestimation of project duration, and budget and changes to requirements. Now, underestimation usually results from not looking closely at the assumptions made when performing the estimates and not considering the risks that can affect those estimates. So we recommend to be sure to document the assumptions related to each area of the estimate noting risks that can push the estimate higher, as well as opportunities that could reduce that overall cost. Now, also, it's important to start this exercise early when building the initial business case for undertaking the project and carry that process forward through all project stages. Make sure the assumptions, risks, and opportunities are identified during the estimate stage and that they're a bit made visible to all stakeholders who will be involved in the project, including those working on the project, the community or other end users of the product, the suppliers and contractors, and any relevant regulatory entities. Some changes to requirements can lead to new risks and other changes can be a way of mitigating a risk. So anticipate possible areas of requirement changes based on similar types of projects from the past and document them in some sort of knowledge base or, or record as risks and opportunities referencing all project stakeholders who will be affected. Again, that could include project owners, project workers, project beneficiaries, suppliers, contractors, regulators, the list goes on. It's also good to make requirements visible in context with the planned project activities and any risks or opportunities associated with the requirement. When evaluating these requirements, we also want to look beyond just cost and schedule impacts. That's a great starting place, but it's not where we want to end. We want to use the risk and opportunity to communicate the potential threat and benefits in each relevant impact category. I could name dozens, maybe hundreds, but let's start with, again, cost and schedule. That's a good starting place, but also resources, technical performance, quality, customer satisfaction, supply and availability. We also want to look at lessons and concerns. The timely communication of concerns, a lack of willingness to acknowledge those concerns, leaving quality inspections until the end of the project, and not learning from past project experiences. Now, a little side note, while it's vital to form these processes around these principles, uh, we at SWORD GRC also firmly believe that the right tools in your technology tool belt can help you achieve these goals more effectively and, and more quickly. So here I've interspersed some slides in this section to give some examples of how Active Risk Manager from SOAR GRC could be an example of how you might assist with implementing these principles and practices. First off, you do want to set the expectation that it's everybody's responsibility 
among all stakeholder groups with the project to identify risks and opportunities. One way we suggest and encourage this participation and engagement is through a streamlined and accessible data collection. With Active Risk Manager, we've enabled everyone to play a role in the risk management process by providing a simple to use light touch risk data entry interface that you can see on the screen here that we call Risk Express. We also wanna consider the successes, the failures, the risks and opportunities from similar projects at the start of the project and when moving through each of the project stages. This is much easier when all the project risks and opportunities are tracked in a single database accessible to everybody, along with issues, incidents, and other notable project outcomes. It's important to make it easy for all stakeholders to introduce risks and opportunities and follow a well-communicated process, that process that we were talking about, to evaluate and act upon them. Spreadsheets are not an effective way to do this because of all the complexities as the projects grow and more people get involved. Once again, that's why we would suggest something like Risk Express to have access for everybody who needs to be involved in the process. When those risks and opportunities are raised, we want to give them the appropriate level of consideration, including escalation or transfer if necessary, as soon as possible. The sooner risks and opportunities are identified, the more flexibility there is to address them and the less it will cost to do so. We also want to make sure that technical impact categories and quality are part of the risk assessment criteria. And we want to monitor quality throughout the process. Using techniques such as bow tie analysis, FAMIA, FAMICA, and Six Sigma to identify root causes that can trigger other risks is a key element of success here. As you can see on the screen, Active Risk Manager allows you to perform cause and effect bow tie analysis to help you identify not just the risks and issues and opportunities, but their related and individually analyzable causes and consequences. Next, we want to apply quantitative impact ratings and statistical analysis techniques to help drive objective decision making about the treatment strategy and resource prioritization for risk mitigation and opportunity pursuit. As you can see here, Active Risk Manager allows you to seamlessly run Monte Carlo impact analyses directly on your risk data, which can provide valuable insights for risk-based risk decision making. And of course, we also want to document project events and outcomes when they do occur. We don't want to wait for a lessons learned review years from the end of the project, since it might take several years to complete any individual project. Our third principle here is about motivations. We also want to look at these project motivations and the motivations of select stakeholders and decisions made in alignment with those stakeholder interests, as they cannot necessarily be in the best interest of the end user of the project deliverable. This might be honestly the most critical driver of project failure and the most difficult to identify and to address if I'm being honest. We should strive for legally binding relationships of project entities that promotes transparency and sharing of risks. For any project where a key objective is the reduction of resources, we wanna identify risks related to that reduced level of resources from a business process perspective as well as the perspective of stakeholders who rely on that process. We want to ensure that there is communication channels and risk processes that can expose decisions that are likely to cause harm. And this is something that it might be hard, but we have to be persistent at. We need to be persistent and we can't settle for personal cover absolution approaches to these type of risks, especially when you have in mind the examples that we talked about earlier, like Flint and Boeing, where people's lives could be at stake. Carl, those are really some solid recommendations. Thank you for that. I hope our audience is able to apply some of them on their future projects. Let's switch more to a, a positive note, uh, looking at, at how those can help by looking at a successful project that used several of these practices you just mentioned. The 2012 London Olympics Games has been recognized as a, as a success from many different perspectives, from the infrastructure and handling of spectator transportation to the games activities themselves, and ultimately to being the greenest games ever. Financially, a key objective was to make sure that there would be a long-term return on investment from the venues that were built for the games. 
Well, many organizations were the key to success of the London Olympics. The Olympic Delivery Authority, known as the ODA, was ultimately accountable. Its chairman, Sir John Ermit, was the lead visionary, and he established the culture of planning, testing, and analysis over and over and over again to make sure that all aspects of the games went as planned. Sometimes the early days of a project can provide a sense of how it will perform over the entire project life cycle. A key ingredient for the London Olympics financial success began with a sensible budget and a fixed deadline. According to Sir John, if you have a skinny budget, you have a skinny chance of success. And there's nothing better than a fixed deadline. He was also a very strong proponent of program control, change management, and rigorous risk management. All things that seem to have been lacking in the project failures that we covered earlier. These fundamental beliefs were carried out through all areas of the pre-games preparations. For example, the ODA applied a quantitative risk analysis approach to understand the financial impacts of risk that could affect their projects and also the value of what mitigating those risks might be. They started to do this at the very beginning of the planning phase and continued running analysis on a regular basis until the games actually opened. This type of risk analysis covered all areas imaginable. For instance, all construction workers got a free health check before working on the project. This led to the identification of people with health and nutrition risk factors, which were mitigated with free breakfast at the start of each construction day. Talk about caring for your workers. Earlier, we talked about some challenges with testing on some of the projects that had failed. Testing for the London Olympics has been characterized as the most comprehensive pre-games testing in history. It included staff, venues, spectator simulations, transportation scenarios, and even scoring and result systems. In fact, the scoring system alone had more than 200,000 man hours of laboratory testing to make sure that all event results would be accurate and above reproach. Carl, I think you can see that with all of these aspects in place and with such a strong culture that was going to make sure that things went as intended, it's pretty easy to see why the London 2012 Olympic Games were such a success. Yeah, thanks, Mike. And as somebody who's admittedly a, a lover of the Olympics, um, it's it's great to have that as such a good example of, of how project management and risk management can go well and, and go right. Uh, we have covered a lot of ground today, and we've gotten several great questions from our audience. Uh, I can tell you right now, there's way more questions than we have time to answer today, um, but I, we will try to go through everyone's question and, and reach out to anyone who we don't, don't have time to talk here on the webinar directly. Um, let's take a few minutes just to answer some of these questions, and then, like I said, uh, I will uh, follow up with, with people who ask questions who we don't get a chance to uh, talk during the session. Mike, uh, the first question I want to ask you from a, a member of our audience, our projects are complex and involve lots of different organizations in the planning and execution phases. Some of these organizations are partners on the project, and other times they're competing for the business. How can we provide a way to have them collaborate and see shared risks while still safeguarding other information? Um, that, yeah, that's actually a pretty common situation, especially with larger projects. Uh, anytime that you get into alliances or, or joint ventures, those can vary from project to project. So you want to make sure that people are able to participate, uh, but don't have access to too much information. What we found is the most successful way to do that is to use a web-based risk management platform that has strong security capabilities that will enable you to protect your sensitive information. And in addition to that, you wanna make sure that you're able to leverage technology such as dashboards and automated notifications so that you can provide the risk information that's relevant for each of those different stakeholders, but make that exclusive to their own particular views. By doing this, you'll have an approach that makes it easy for all of your parties to enter and update their own information in a timely manner, while still giving you shared risk visibility across all project stakeholders. 
Mike, our, our second question comes uh, from another. Uh, this is this this question is the size of our projects range from small projects under five million dollars to mega projects in the billions. Do we need to include smaller projects in our risk management approach? And if so, how can we do that in a way that isn't too much for our project teams? Well, the short answer is yes. Ideally, all projects should be considered regardless of size. We've seen plenty of cases where a combination of small project failures has led to catastrophic events. That's especially true for IT, as we saw with the, the one in five projects potentially killing the business, to R&D, and even smaller building and infrastructure projects. Managing all projects in one system with the ability to roll up and view risk at, at project program and portfolio levels will help you with the prioritization and resourcing decisions across your organizations. It also reduces the chance of small projects causing reputational harm. And that's most likely to occur if you're repeating some of those same types of failures on similar small projects in the future. And there's an additional benefit to this approach too, by including all risk in their outcomes of all sizes of projects, you're building a corporate knowledge base that can be used when bidding on new work to accelerate that process. And also when developing new project managers to take the reins, because as I'm sure you know, many of our current project experts are getting pretty close to retirement age. Certainly, thanks, Mike. Um, man, there are a lot of great questions in the Q and A, and it, it's uh, it's hard to to know what to go with. Um, I do have one more that's kind of related to the last question, uh, maybe just as a follow up. Um, if we're going to use one system for all projects, do we have to apply the same degree of risk rigor and analysis for all of them? And do we need to score all the risks using the same risk band limits, regardless of the project size? Yeah. Certainly a, a really important question. And I'd say that the answer to this one, short answer is, is no. You don't need to handle all assessments exactly the same way. And in fact, that's really key is you want to be able to have that flexibility on a project and program basis, but you still do need the ability to have some consistency and to normalize that information so that you can roll up risk and make broader decisions. In fact, the best practice that we've seen so far is to be able to set risk thresholds and that degree of risk analysis rigor based on the size of the project and the potential impact of the risk within it. So when it comes to a software tool, look for one that allows you to set scoring criteria based on the size of each project. And also make sure that you have a way to roll up the risk and display them using both the risk original assessment criteria, as well as at the program portfolio and enterprise levels. Now, the, the key is that this should be possible without requiring your project teams to go through and to rescore the risk for each level. Thanks, Mike. Really appreciate your answers to those. And I want to thank our audience for all these questions. Um, that is all the time we have for now, uh, but we will be back in touch with you to address the remaining questions. Uh, we'll, we'll download all those and, and go through them uh, one by one. Thank you so much for your investment and involvement in this webinar today. If you would like to learn more about any of the projects we've discussed, you can find plenty of content online. We did find, as, as David mentioned at the beginning of this, this is all publicly available information. Um, this is the list of things we talked about today. We'd be happy to follow up on that if you have any questions as well. And if you'd like to learn how a strong risk management software tool can help you enhance your risk management process and drive more favor favorable project results, please do reach out and talk to us. Uh, if you can contact us at www.sword-grc.com. Uh, this is the bread and butter of what we love to talk about and would love to help you with and would look forward to talking to any of you um, if you want to reach out. Thank you once again for joining us today. We wish you all a safe and prosperous 2021 and look forward to speaking with you again soon. This concludes today's event.